All right, First Timothy for beginners, uh, lesson number 11, disciplining leaders. First Timothy chapter five, beginning in verse 17. So we're in a, a section of Paul's letter to Timothy where the apostle is talking about various issues of concern to the church, not necessarily connected to each other. In the last week's lesson, we discussed the instructions Paul gave for the care of widows in the church, which seemed to be a significant issue for them at that time. Uh, the church wasn't sure which ones should be helped, and Paul outlined some basic guidelines for the care of those Christian women who were truly in need. So in the next section, Paul is going to instruct Timothy concerning the way one should deal with leaders who cause trouble. You know, he's talked about individual teachers or individuals in the congregation that are causing problems, but now what happens when it's the leaders that are causing the trouble? So as I said, there was trouble in the church where Timothy preached and apparently some of it was caused by those who were or wanted to be in leadership. And we know that the, uh, the potential for damage to the church is great when the division or the trouble is caused by those who are in leadership roles. So Paul cautions Timothy about how to deal with this uh, very difficult and delicate at times uh, situation. So verses 17 to 25 uh, deals with three subjects uh, actually. The first of which is uh, the honoring of elders. Let's begin with the elders who are doing a good job. Uh, verse 17, 18, let's read that. It says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So Paul describes three areas of biblical elders' uh, uh, work. One, ruling or leadership. Uh, two, preaching, that is the proclamation of the word, and three, teaching. Uh, instruction and application of the word in Christian life. So leaders in the church are to be busy and absorbed in these duties. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. The problem lies in understanding the next verse. Paul says that those who do these things well and make a great effort at them um, are worthy of double honor. So there are a lot of opinions as to what this term double honor refers to. I'll show you a couple. One is double pay, uh, or honor plus pay, or twice the amount that uh, 60 year old widows would receive, uh, or two kinds of honor, one for age, we honor them for their experience, and we honor them for the work that they do as elders. So there's nothing wrong with an elder who uh, devotes his entire effort to the church and teaching and ministry, receiving a salary from the church. We know that. We have someone in our own congregation in that role. Uh, I don't believe, however, that double honor means that he should receive double the salary of someone else. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. Paul says double honor in relationship to the service they give and then provides two examples to illustrate his point. The ox, for example, receives something back from the grain it is threshing, and that is some food. Uh, from the grain uh, as he's working. Uh, the worker, he says, receives something back from his work, the pay agreed upon for his effort. And the elder receives something back from those he leads and teaches, honor for his role as elder in the church, uh, perhaps extra honor for his extra effort and ability in preaching and teaching, even including uh, remuneration. So this extra honor is seen in the next section where Paul will show Timothy the care taken in dealing with elders accused uh, of, of sin of some kind. So this is the part where we uh, talk about uh, the correction, disciplining of uh, elders. Uh, verse 19 and 20, he says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also uh, will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in the spirit of partiality. 
So accusations against elders needed to be brought up by a minimum of two or three witnesses. Three witnesses will make a strong case. Realize what he's saying here. The idea is that no charge can be brought forward unless there are at least two, perhaps three witnesses that do so. You can't even bring an accusation. This is part of the special honor that we give to our uh, elders. If there are not at least two or three witnesses at hand to prove the accusation, you cannot even make the accusation. I mean, we see all kinds of ruined reputations of people simply accused of something, especially in our day and age. There was a time where if you were accused, well, people would hold judgment until there was a trial or there was an investigation of some kind. Nowadays, just the accusation completely ruins your reputation, whether you're you know, innocent or guilty. And so the idea of having at least two witnesses before you even bring an accusation uh, protects the church leaders from this type of uh, you know, uh, mob rule, if you wish. Uh, on the other hand, if the witnesses have a case, then this protection cannot be given to the leader. Of course, if two can bring an accusation, three even better can bring an accusation, well then we have to go forward and take a look at uh, what's going on. Um, those elders guilty of continuing sin uh, need to be rebuked by the evangelist or the other elders, if there are other elders, so that they will be warned not to behave badly. Elders guilty of serious sin, you know, fornication or heresy, uh, need to be removed because their sin will eventually affect the congregation in one way or another. Of course, these are difficult instructions and Timothy needs to make sure that in every situation he acts in a fair way, very important. I mean, it's easy to confront a person that you may have issues with or struggle with over control or power, but Timothy must be committed to following these instructions with everyone and not show any type of favoritism. You can't let your favorite elder you know, give him a pass, but someone else guilty of the same thing, him you, know, you investigate. In the church, it's easy to let things slide for your friends and those you like. But when it comes to discipline, Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, he needs to judge and act with impartiality, fairness. Then he talks about selecting elders. Verse 22, he says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So the laying on of hands was a gesture used at that time and today to signify a variety of things in the, in the church. Uh, it was a sign of blessing. In Matthew 19, 13, Matthew writes, then some children were brought to him, brought to Jesus, so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the, the disciples rebuked him. So it was a sign of blessing, a way of blessing someone else. It was also a sign of healing. Mark 8, 25, uh, then again he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. So uh, you know, it's always the laying on of hands, but the context decides you know, what the laying on of hands is symbolizing at that moment. Laying on of hands, also a sign of empowerment, Acts chapter eight. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, so on and so forth. And so the apostles, if the apostles laid hands on an individual, they could transfer the ability to do miraculous signs to someone else. Uh, but that ability was reserved only to the apostles. Only the apostles, you know, the apostles could lay hands on an individual and that individual might be able to speak in tongues or a prophecy and, and so on and so forth. But that individual couldn't, you know, go to someone else and lay hands on that person in order to transfer spiritual gifts. It was always the laying on of the hands of the apostles uh, that um, gave the uh, spir uh, spiritual gifts. One of the reasons why we don't believe that people have uh, those miraculous gifts today, 
because we have God's word to do the work and to confirm the witness, but also because the apostles, once they passed away, there was no one left with that authority. Anyways, uh, sign of, so laying on of hands, sign of empowerment, and also a sign of commendation in Acts 6, 6. It says, and these they brought before the apostles and after praying, they laid hands on them. These were the deacons, those who were to serve as deacons. And so the laying on of uh, the hands of the elders meant different things. And the context uh, helps us to discern what exactly is taking place. Well, we still use the laying on of hands as a sign of blessing and as uh, a sign of commendation, but not one of healing or empowerment. I mean, God still heals and hears our prayers for healing, but no longer grants humans the miraculous powers given to the apostles and transferred to others by the laying on of their hands. So what Timothy is talking about here, or what Luke is talking about to Timothy here, is the laying on of hands to commend or to ordain someone into the office of elder or deacon or evangelist, okay? So Paul warns Timothy not to ordain or to put men into leadership too quickly, meaning without making sure that they qualify and that they're tested first. If he does, and because of this they stumble because of inexperience or immaturity, then Timothy will share a responsibility and a portion of the guilt for their sins or their failures because he shouldn't have put them in too quickly. So Timothy is ultimately responsible for not getting involved in other sins by ordaining men into ministry or leadership roles too quickly or you know, without enough uh, verification. Um, uh, so we continue with chapter five, uh, verses 23 to 25. In the last section, Paul continues to talk about elders, but he does so in, a, in an indirect way. So let's read verse 23, go back to Timothy. He says, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your uh, frequent uh, ailments. Now it seems Timothy only drank water, which was contrary to the custom of the day, Perhaps he did this to make sure that no one would dare accuse him of any kind of alcohol abuse. But Timothy's habit made him vulnerable to illness because the water in that day was not clean, especially in the cities. So if he falls ill, he's not going to be able to carry out his work. So Paul encourages him to drink wine in moderation, little wine, in order to maintain his good health. If he, as a leader, is sick from dysentery or other ailments, he's not going to be able to, uh, you know, he won't be effective. Uh, this is not, of course, a general command for all Christians to drink wine. Uh, because our water is treated, there's no reason we have to drink wine because you know, our water is no good. You know, our water is treated here, we can, we can drink it, it's safe. But on the other hand, it is a passage that makes it difficult to defend the idea that drinking wine is a sin. You see what I'm saying? You can't have it both ways here. Keep in mind, however, that the wine of that day, the first century, contained no more than three, perhaps, percent, three, four, maybe, percent alcohol. Today, wine, just wine that you buy in a store, has 12, 13 percent alcohol. And the custom at that time was to add some water to the wine to further dilute the alcohol, uh, alcohol content. So Timothy has a, an important role to play in appointing and training leaders in the church. And he can't do this if he's constantly ill. So Paul you know, gives him a, a kind of a remedy, if you wish, that was uh, available to him at this time. Verse 24 and five. Um, this is a summary statement here regarding the entire issue of choosing or rejecting different men for the position of leadership. So this is what this section is about, beginning in verse 22, where Timothy has to be careful not to be too hasty you know, in appointing men as elders. So Paul is saying, in the matter of choosing the right man for eldership, you know, comma, verse 24, he says, the sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow uh, after. 
So he's saying to him basically, look, don't worry about choosing the wrong person. When deciding about a man's worthiness, you'll be able to see fairly easily his faults and weaknesses. What he's saying here, you know, the sins of some men are quite evident. A man who has a lousy temper, if you're around him enough, you'll, you'll see that temper flare up. So he said, some men, you know, their sins are evident. Their sins seem to parade before them, already evident to be judged, as I say. Someone, for example, who's arrogant or foolish uh, or hasty you know, or, or, or constantly negative, you know, you'll, you'll discern that rather easily from them. You know, not, not to worry. You'll be able to see the ones who are you know, uh, evidently not qualified to be, uh, to be elders. Then he says, for others, their sins follow, meaning that their sins are not evident. Okay. Their sins are behind them, so to speak. However, in the same manner, these sins also will become evident when Timothy examines these men in light of the qualifications that Paul has outlined to him previously. So some men, their disqualification is pretty evident. You know, you're, you're going to not choose them and it's pretty evident why. Other men, not as evident, you know, not, their, their, their failings and weaknesses are not as evident, but if you dig in a little bit, if you examine them according to the qualifications that Paul's already outlined for an elder, you'll be able to see if that person qualifies or not. Verse 25, he says, likewise also deeds that are good are quite evident and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. So Paul states the same idea again, but this time uses the word deeds instead of character, okay? And so here, good deeds, he says, are evident. A man's good life will be easily discerned because his good works will be known. And conversely, an evil man will not be able to hide his evil deeds. They will eventually be found out as well. It's one of the reasons, for example, in the church when we, let's say we want to uh, uh, you know, appoint uh, certain elders and, and perhaps two or three men are selected and uh, we give the congregation uh, information about the qualification of, of elders based on the Bible and we ask them, these three men here are being considered for the role of, of elder and we ask the congregation if there's any reason, if you know something about these men that might disqualify them or qualify them, you know, let us know. So that's another way that the, the, the church is able to discern the qualifications of an individual. Perhaps the elders don't know the whole story behind a certain individual, but there's, usually, you know, there's bound to be someone in the congregation who will know uh, the good or the bad of an individual to confirm the decision that the, um, that the, elders, are, uh, uh, the elders are making. So Paul warns Timothy about not appointing men to leadership too quickly, lest he share the responsibility for their sins and their errors. But then he comforts him by telling him that it'll be evident who the good and the bad men are by the fruit of their character and their lives. All right, um, a couple of lessons here uh, that we uh, can uh, draw uh, from uh, the material that we've covered uh, briefly this morning. First of all, let's remember that elders are human. I mean, we know that, but we need to remember that. We all know this to be true, but many times we expect them to be above humanity. You know, make no mistakes, no character weaknesses, no limits on their willingness to serve or put up with laziness or other bad behavior by the members. You know? Most of the time, they also have jobs and families to care for and have volunteered to care for the church family as well. Of course, we owe them honor and obedience and respect as the Bible says, Hebrews 13 verse seven. But in addition to this, I say that we also owe them the benefit of the doubt. Let's not assume, for example, that an honest mistake is really a purposeful slight. This is one of the hardest things to bear in ministry when people are, you know, get their feelings hurt by what the, the minister, the elder, the deacon said or did and think that they did it on purpose. 
You know, as if somebody goes into ministry with the, with the goal of hurting other people. Well, it's the last thing you want to do, but sometimes things happen you know, where someone's feelings gets hurt. We need to give the leaders you know, the benefit of the doubt. Or that a lack of attention, for example, concerning your need or issue is a planned insult or a proof that the elder doesn't care. Maybe, you know, I tell people, maybe his wife is sick or maybe he's had to work overtime. Maybe that's why he didn't call after your surgery or you know, whatever. Not jumping to negative conclusions, not having a, you know, a hair trigger and getting our feelings hurt will not only help the elder do his work, but it'll also spare us a lot of unnecessary turmoil when it comes to the elders. So let's remember they're humans, they're, they're only men trying to do a, you know, a larger than life job on behalf of the church in service to the Lord. Uh, another lesson, uh, let's remember that elders need both encouragement and correction. You know, worst case scenario for an elder is when he will listen and accept encouragement, but refuse correction. Like, uh, you know, he likes being told, uh, atta boy, that's a good job, but he won't listen if you're trying to tell him something, you know, that something is wrong or something needs to be changed. Elders need both encouragement and correction. Why? Well, because they're human, that's why. They need encouragement in order to validate their work. Encouragement answers their main question, is what I'm doing making a difference? A positive word, a note of appreciation, a hug, all of these say to the elder that his efforts are recognized and needed and appreciated. It is this type of feedback that neutralizes unfair criticism and fuels the elder's desire to continue serving because believe me, elders get to a point where they're saying to themselves, I don't need this, I don't need to do this, this is becoming too difficult, Especially, you know, let's say someone criticizes, not the elder, but cri starts criticizing his wife or his child. You know, the thought goes through his mind, you know, I'm, I am going to heaven, I am saved. I don't need to do this here. I don't need to serve in such a way to cause my wife sorrow or my child sorrow. So they need encouragement and certain times, they need correction in order to protect their leadership and the souls for which they're responsible. So Paul gives careful instructions on how to go about doing this so that a simple course correction about an elder's attitude and behavior or teaching doesn't turn into a witch hunt or a public hanging, you know what I'm saying? Correcting leaders can yield a tremendous amount of good for the elder who through humility will grow spiritually because of the correction, and it'll be good for the congregation that will benefit from the renewed spirit of the corrected elder. It's a win-win proposition when it's done correctly, when it's done according to the scripture, and it's of course done with an attitude of love. We need to remember that elders have a heavy load of responsibility given to them by God, but if they are encouraged often and receive correction in humility, both the man and the church will, uh, will benefit from that. Okay, we're going to stop here as, uh, yeah, for, for this time and continue on uh, our study of uh, 1 Timothy next week. Thank you for your attention.